Like I said, we're going to be preaching through the book of Titus on, in, on Thursdays. A short book, only three chapters. Um, we'll start in verse 1 there. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledging the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So Paul, who was an apostle of Jesus Christ, Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. So God's elect are God's chosen people, and it says they're acknowledging of the truth. And that's how simple salvation is, acknowledging the truth and believing on, not just acknowledging that it exists and turning away from it, but actually believing. And it says, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. So this is a proof verse to say that God can't lie, and I sometimes go here when, I, when I'm giving the gospel to people, but some people will want to bring up this fact about hope, that, you see, you can't really know it, you're just hoping for eternal life. And they say, you can't know, you're just hoping. And they twist this verse to, to mean that, but if you look up the word hope in a dictionary, one of the definitions of hope, well, a lot of them are the definition you think for, it's like you're wishing something would happen, but another definition is to look forward to with desire and reasonable confidence. Okay, in Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 3 to 5, it says, We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, where have you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel? So when you hear Colossians 1, verse 5 there, it says, The hope is laid up for you in heaven. You're not wishing that you'll get it, but it's already laid up for you in heaven. If, if it was just a, a, a thing that if you lived a good enough life, you could get, you could get it, well, then it wouldn't be laid up for you in heaven already. And he's saying these people that have faith in Christ Jesus, because that's the only requirement for having that hope laid up in heaven, they have this hope laid up in heaven. And some of you say, well, I'm not, I'm not convinced yet. I still think it's just you've got to hope that you'll make it. You know? Like when you ask people, do you know for sure you're going to have Well, I hope, I hope, hope so. And, well, you could know so. Um, in Romans 8, starting in verse 23, it says, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of our body. So he's saying, we're waiting for this to happen, the redemption of our body, where our body is going to get redeemed. Because we are saved, but our body is still an unsaved body because we're going to get a, a renewed body, a redeemed body, uh, a new spiritual body that doesn't have the, the, the carnal flesh anymore. They're, they're groaning within ourselves, waiting for God. But sometimes when things are going bad, we're just, oh man, I can hardly wait till heaven. We won't have any sorrow, we won't have any troubles, we don't, you know, we won't have any worries. Uh, so it's, we're waiting for the adoption to with the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he have hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we with patience wait for it. So we're with patience waiting for it. Not, I hope we're going to get it, but you're just patiently waiting for it. It's like hope is coming, okay? Let's say you're in battle. Let's say Winkler was surrounded by the, the Chinese or Koreans, okay? But we know, we've, we've got news that half an hour away, the army is coming, okay? Hope is on its way. We're not hoping that they're coming. We know they're coming, but Hope is on its way. You see that how there's different definitions of hope. So, hope is laid out for us in heaven. So, who is writing this letter? And it gives you uh, the answer in, in letter uh, verse one. It says, "Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ." So. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter. Who is he writing it to? He's writing it to a guy named Titus. Okay? He's writing it to us also because all scripture is profitable for doctrine and, and for reproof and so on. 
So it, it was written to Titus, but it's for us all. We, we don't believe in dispensation in this group here. We, we believe that the whole Bible is applicable to us. Obviously, certain things were just until the time of the Reformation, but we don't believe in seven different dispensations. So who is Titus? Well, in verse 4 there, it said, To Titus, my own son, after the common faith. So was Titus Paul's son? No, because Paul didn't have any children. He wasn't even married. Okay? It says, my own son, after the common faith. Okay? He was his son because he wanted to the Lord, is what it sounds like to me. Uh, turn to 2 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, uh, yeah, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number uh, 2. So in 1 Corinthians 4, 15 it says, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. So that's how, how Titus was his son through the gospel. Because in another place, it calls Titus his brother. So he was his son in the gospel of Jesus Christ because he gave him the gospel and he got saved. And when we, we win people to Christ out soul winning, they actually become our spiritual children. I don't know if, if there will be some uh, recognition or, um, or if it will be known that those people we want to Christ. I, I probably, I think it's, it's likely, but either way, on this earth, they're now our spiritual children. Not that that gives has much um, significance here, except for that they're no longer going to hell, which is which is a really good thing. Okay, so who's Titus? So when did he he, he meet Titus? Um, in Galatians two. And if you can keep your finger there in Corinthians, if you want to, you can head over to Galatians, but um, I'm just going to read five verses there. In verse 1 it says, Galatians 2 verse 1, it says, Then fourteen years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also. Okay, so this is a trip that he has Barnabas along and he took Titus also. Okay, but remember, Paul split with Barnabas in Acts chapter 15 and then he went with Silas and Barnabas went with the other guy. Okay, so this is before he split with uh, Barnabas, that Titus is already traveling with him. And the other thing is, um, he only met, it seems to be that he met Tim, Paul met Timothy in Acts chapter 16. So he knew Titus before uh, Timothy, it seems. And Galatians 2 2. And I went up by revelation, communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. So they were compelling him to get circumcised. These people that were called brethren, since they were false brethren, they were compelling them to be circumcised. Hey, you got to get circumcised. And in verse 5, it says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. So they didn't even give me room to talk about it for an hour. That the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So he, he, did, he did not agree with uh, Titus getting circumcised. That wasn't something we have to do in the New Testament. They didn't have to do it the Old Testament to be saved spiritually. Okay? They did have to get, the males had to get circumcised in order to, to congregate with the children of Israel. But to be saved, they didn't need that. That was a sign. Um, but, so Paul and, and Titus did not make that mistake, but he did make that mistake with Timothy in Acts chapter 16. So if he did make that mistake, with Timothy, and I think he learned, I think this is after that, that episode with Timothy, um, where he made that mistake. So if you're there in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, let's look at verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord, I had no rest in my spirit, because I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. 
Okay, so he's in, when he came to Troas, which is, um, I believe it's in, from Greece, it's, it's east, basically is a simple way to explain it. And he didn't find him there, so he went to Macedonia, which is like northern Greece, okay? So he, he went, he went basically uh, northwest from Troas to, to Macedonia. Um, skip over chapter 7. So this kind of continues the story. So he, he had no rest in the spirit because he, he was looking for Titus. He was, I guess, expecting him or wondering where he was because you can not just go, you know, text him on WhatsApp. Hey, where are you? Or, or you know, email him or something or call him. In those days, you had, the mail wasn't even as reliable as now. You might send a letter with, with somebody you heard was going somewhere, okay? And in fact, even in my generation, if, if family or somebody heard that they were making a trip to Mexico or something, they would send letters along with them, okay? You know, we did have the mail, but then I think it was more of a reliable thing. I don't know if the Mexican postal service wasn't good or if they just wanted to hand deliver them, but they would deliver things for people that they didn't even really personally know. Okay, so 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5. For when we were coming to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without our fightings, within our fears, nevertheless, God, that comforted those that are cast down, comforted us by the coming of Titus, not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you, when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoice the more, for though I may be sorry with the letter, I do not repent, though I did repent, for I perceived the same epistle, may be sorry the word but for a season. Okay? So it's it sounds like Titus came from Corinth and brought news because Paul, remember, Paul had sent a letter to the Corinthians telling about this form, condemning this fornication that happened in the church and giving them all sorts of instructions and exhortations. And he was comforted when, when Timothy came, not just because he found, finally found Titus, or not Timothy, Titus, he finally found him, but because of the good news that Titus brought. He was coming from the church at Corinth there, and he brought good news that they repented, okay? And, and, and the thing is, people will use this passage to teach repent of your sins for salvation. But it's talking about a group of saved people in a church that just had to repent of wrong things, that the, the way they were handling church affairs and so on. That they allowed a fornicator to stay in their church. So in chapter 2, he's looking for Titus. Chapter 7, he's uh, comforted by the coming of Titus. He's strengthened by the coming of Titus. So Titus was in Corinth and came to Macedonia. Look at uh, chapter 8, Second Corinthians. Chapter 8, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy, their deep poverty, and bondage unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power a very record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord, and not to us by the will of God. Verse 6, insomuch that we desire Titus, as, as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. Okay, this is talking about... A gift, okay, that that they received from the, the Corinthians is, is the way I understand it. And I don't know if Titus brought the gift to Paul, you know, if it, whatever it was, because it might not have necessarily just the money, it could have been food or raiment and, and probably money too. But Anyways, Paul here is saying that we desire Titus that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. So whatever he had started there, he wanted him to finish. And it sounds like it has to do with this uh, giving of, the, uh, of, of this gift from the church 
to uh, call I, I me mean, for another church. Okay, then we'll drop down to verse 16, where it mentions Titus again. Actually, we'll drop down to 13. For I mean not that other men be eased and be burdened by the equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, and their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, yet he that had gathered much and nothing over, and he that had gathered little had no lack. Okay, so this is talking about the Church of Corinth making up their abundance and to help out another church. Verse 16, But thanks be to God, which with the same earnest care to the heart of Titus for you, for indeed he accepted the exhortation that being more for of his own accord he went unto you. And we have sent with him the brother whose praise is in the gospel throughout all the churches, and not that only, but who was also chosen the churches to travel with us with this grace, which is administered by us the glory of the same Lord and declaration of your ready mind. Avoiding this, that no man should blame us in this abundance which is administered by us, providing for honest things not only in sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. And we have sent with them our brother, whom we have oftentimes proved diligent in many things, but now much more diligent upon the great confidence which I have in you. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of, they are the messengers of the churches for the glory of Christ. Wherefore, show ye to them and before the churches the proof of your love, never boasting on your behalf. So it sounds like Titus is going to collect this gift. And Paul is kind of giving, uh, he's vouching for Titus, and who he says has oftentimes proved diligent in many things. So Titus had a good report. So that kind of gives us some background. It's actually quite interesting how many times Titus is mentioned in the New Testament here. Uh, so that kind of gives us background of who Titus is. Okay. So where was he though when this letter was written? Okay. In verse number 5 of Titus 1. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and are ordained elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Okay, so Titus was left in Crete by Paul. Okay, so that sounds like he was there when Paul visited the island of Crete. Okay, so there is basically two large islands, and there might be more further west, but two large islands as you come from like Israel and Syria, there's Cyprus, okay, which is south of Turkey, modern day Turkey, and then further west is this island of Crete, which is closer to Greece. And he left Titus there, and it says, ordained elders in every city, okay? There's, there's groups of people in every city, but they needed elders, they needed leadership, they needed a bishop, they, they needed a pastor, okay? So he says, go ordain elders in every city, because they needed it. Now, that's verse 5. But then he goes on to list the qualifications of the people he was supposed to ordain. So, he's supposed to ordain the elders, and then verse 6, he starts to give the qualifications of the people that he should ordain in every city. Verse 6, if any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. Let's stop there. So, the easy one, uh, just to explain, not so, always so easy to do, is that people know that have children, it says that children should not be accused of riot or being unruly. Okay, what's unruly? You're not behaving yourself. Riot. Just, just to understand what a riot is. Like, remember, I don't know if you remember, but in Vancouver, it was like game seven, they lost the Stanley Cup final. And what did they do? They were just going crazy on the street, like tipping police cars, setting things on fire, looting stores, they're just going nuts, okay? So in other words, you should have your children shouldn't be out of control. Is if, I mean, any, nobody's children should be out of control, but especially not a bishop. Because what, 
if you can't even if you can't even uh, rule his own house, then how is he going to to rule the house of God? Okay, and, and I was just thinking in First Timothy three, you know, keep your finger in Titus one, and then but also go to First Timothy three three because these two are parallel passages, and both of them give the qualifications of a bishop. Okay, so in in Titus one it says. Having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. And in 1 Timothy 3, 4, it says, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. What does that mean? His children aren't supposed to be floating in air? Gravity? No. Gravity just means that they're not just ridiculous or crazy. Gravity means serious or critical in nature is the definition. Um... Or you could say grave is the root word of it, not grave as in a, as in a hole in the ground or in a stone. The grave is in serious or solemn. So the children are supposed to be under control if he's going to pick this guy and ordain this guy as a bishop. And people will say, well, that only means if they have children, they're supposed to be under control. And no, the Bible says having faithful children. Okay, how can you have faithful children if you don't have any children? In Timothy, it says having his children in subjection. You might be able to try to twist that and say, if you have children, they should be in subjection, but no. And notice it's plural, children. And why is that? Because raising children will give you a lot of life skills. It'll teach you patience, okay? It'll teach you leadership. There's so many things that raising children will help you with. And if, if you don't have had at least two children to the point where people can see that they're unruly or not unruly or, or accused of riot, then, then how do people know that you know how to do it, okay? And you see cases of where people take the job of a pastor, okay? And they don't even have two children. Or, this the second one was just barely born and was ordained, like the guy in BC. Okay? And then what happens later? You find out he's a novice. Okay, so you're supposed to have children, you're supposed to be faithful, they're not supposed to be accused of right or unruly. But notice it also said if any be blameless. Okay? How can you say that you're blameless? People, well, uh, I had a conversation with one guy from a different Baptist church, and he says, like we were talking about blameless, and he was almost trying to say that that people would call that perfect. Well, as in the way we think perfect. Nobody is blameless as far as without sin. But in Luke chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, it actually does call somebody blameless. It says, There was in the days of Herod the king of Judea a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So these are John the Baptist's parents. Okay? And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Blameless. Okay? It says that Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, they were both blameless. That doesn't mean they never sinned. Okay? It's just blameless. They were, they were trying to do the best they could, and they were walking in all the commandments of the Lord. So, so that's what blameless means. Verse 7 of, of Titus, it says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry. It says something similar in, in uh, 1 Timothy 3. It says, Bishop must then be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. So it talks about good behavior. And then later it says, not a brawler. Okay, a brawler would be somebody that, that would get soon angry, I, I think. Maybe it's in Titus 1 7, it says, For a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God, not self willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to filthy lucre. So what's filthy lucre? It's, it's money that's obtained in a dishonest way. Okay, lucre is wealth that's. That's not earned. And it's, 
says something almost word for word, but just, just not in the same order. It says, and in 1 Timothy it says, verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 3, it says, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Okay? So, somebody that's greedy of filthy lucre is also covetous. And I'm kind of going back and forth here, but I just want to show you the similarities here. Titus 1.8, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. What does it mean to be sober? Okay, sober, obviously we should be sober as in not drunk on alcohol or high on drugs. But it's also, sober means serious. You're not just joking around 100% of the time. That doesn't mean you, you, you never joke around, but you should be serious about what you do. Verse 9, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Okay, and we're called sound doctrine Baptist and notice it says you hold fast to the faithful word, the Bible, right? And why? So that you're able with sound doctrine to exhort, which means to strongly encourage, and to convince the gainsayers. Okay? What are gainsayers? They're people that say, no, you don't, you can't get saved just by believing on Jesus Christ. You've got to repent of your sins, or you've got to live a good life. Or other doctrines, if you're gainsayer, God didn't really make the rhythm six literal days. Different things. This, this bishop, this this pastor needs to be able to convince people, okay, and to exhort people with sound doctrine, holding fast the faithful word. When it says fast, there doesn't mean quickly. Fast as in fastener. I mean, by nails or screws, they're called fasteners because it holds it tight in place. It holds it fast in place. So I'll, I'll just read for you First uh, Timothy three one to just. Seven, and you can can hear how similar it is to uh, Titus one. It says there, this is a true saying: If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy, filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Subjection means that they'll listen to him. Okay? That they don't just say no and go do whatever they want. Verse 5. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and a snare of the devil. So he has to have a good report of them that are without. Just imagine, okay, there's this pastor and then he gets convicted of cheating on his income tax. Is that a good report to them that are without? No. Okay? He's cheating on his income tax. How honest is he with his preaching? Or or somebody that rips people off or or whatever, or it's, it's a report of him going around drinking or fornicating or whatever the case is. That's not a good report. So it's important that the, the man has a good report. And yes, it has to be a man, but it says the husband of one wife. Okay. okay? It doesn't say the wife of one husband, it says the husband of one wife. So it has to be a man. And the one thing I don't think I really touched on is a lover of hospitality. Okay? And in, in, in First Timothy it says given to hospitality. Okay? That means inviting people over for meals. It means having people over at your house. Okay, nowadays it's it's a little bit different. There's there's hotels and things. Back then they had inns as, as well, but we have it a lot more convenient now. You can travel further distances with the vehicles we have and airplanes and so on. Your journeys don't have to take so so many days. But it's important still even in this day and age to have hospitality because some people have entertained angels unawares. Okay? They think they're just being like, well, what did Abraham do? Okay? He, he runs and gets all this food ready. He runs one place, tells 
the servitude, butcher this, this goat. Then he goes and makes some cakes of, of bread and he runs and, like, enthusiastically and, and he, he was hospitable to them. He, he, he fed them. Okay, and then in 1 Timothy 3, it also gives qualifications for deacons and it, and it gives a list there. And that doesn't mean that these qualifications only apply to a deacon. And, and, like, and so they don't apply to a pastor. No, a pastor should be above the, the qualifications of a deacon. It shouldn't, shouldn't be, well, that particular thing only applies to deacons, not to pastors. In fact, we should all strive to do each one, each thing of this, except for, of course, um, the, the women shouldn't be trying to be a husband of one wife. Or, yeah, exactly. They shouldn't. The husband of one wife, only men should try to be the husband of one wife. We have mixed up. We have an upside down world nowadays. Okay, so that's the qualifications of a bishop, and that's what Titus was there for. Okay? Because why did Paul leave Titus in Crete? It was to ordain elders in every city. It wasn't just going to have one church, okay? It was in every city. Because even though you look on the map, Crete doesn't look like a, a big island. I didn't look up how long it was. But in those days, where you travel a lot by foot. If you're a little bit better off, you maybe had a donkey or a horse. And so you needed churches closer together. Now we can, we, we don't want to. I mean, I hear people complaining. They have a good church within an hour driving distance and it's too far for them. It's like, wow. I mean, you go drive to an hour for a well-paying job. Why wouldn't you drive an hour to go to a good church? I don't understand. I mean, because there's people are driving two and three hours one way to church. Obviously, driving that distance isn't practical for everybody. But anyways, he was there to ordain uh, elders in every church so they could have have independent churches, okay? It wasn't like Paul was some pope or something. He was supposed to, um, Titus was supposed to ordain the people and then they became independent churches, okay? And we need a Titus in Canada, okay? We need somebody that is sent out by a church to ordain elders in every city because we don't have very many good churches. And never mind good churches. When we were looking, we couldn't even find a church in Manitoba that clearly taught the right gospel. We, we thought, we, I found one in Portage, okay? And then later one time I was there, and he's preaching against Pastor Anderson, saying, Pastor Anderson doesn't believe in repentance. Okay, well maybe he just misunderstood because he's got sound yet talking in his ear. Maybe he didn't understand. So maybe the guy wasn't really uh, preaching the right doctrine. But it was, he finds out, you listen to Pastor Anderson, we weren't even even welcome in his church. Okay, and then this other guy in town here, well, he gives a money presentation, okay? And I asked him, you know, somebody that's living with their girlfriend but believes the gospel and call upon the name of the Lord, is that person saved? And he said, no, it takes more than a head knowledge to be saved. Well, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It doesn't say, get, be willing to give up or give up living with your girlfriend. But just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. So we need a, a person like Titus that is sent out by a person like Paul to start a church in Canada. Obviously, our group doesn't have a pastor, and I, I pray for a pastor, and I hope you all are praying for a pastor too, so that we can be a le legitimate church and not just a fellowship. And we need to pray that God will send us a leader, and that he's a, a good leader, that meets all the qualifications, that holds fast the faithful word, and uses sound doctrine to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Because we have a lot of gainsayers in Canada, in the U.S., and throughout the world. Even among Baptists, there are gainsayers, okay? There's just all these repentant sins to be saved, Baptists. There's a, there's a rock-tart Baptist that believe in aliens and weird stuff like that. And even though they say they, they, they're King James only, but they've got the gospel wrong, they're not my brother. Okay? Never mind the Baptists, but then... Then we've got all these Jehovah's false witnesses and Mormons and Pentecostals and all these people, these gazing people. The Bible says in, in, in Titus 1.11, whose mouths must be stopped. In other words, we've got to put a stop to their influence. Why? Because it says, 
who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Okay? So these people are doing it for the sake of money to get rich and popular. Okay? People like Joel Osteen, his huge mega church. Why does he have that big smile? It's because his bank account is full and overfull. Guys like Creflo Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, like some of these guys have their own private jets and mansions and things like that. They are, are, are gainsaying or filthy Luther sake. They're doing preaching just to itch people's ears so that they feel good about themselves. They're, they're, not, they're not prophets of God. They're not bishops. And they're definitely not blameless. They're there as a motivational speaker just to make people feel good about themselves and, and then put some money in, in, in their pocket. So these people's mouths must be stopped because they, they subvert verbal laws. But it, it, before that it says, for there are many unruly and vain talkers, deceivers, but it says, especially they of the circumcision. Especially back then, the Jews were ones that were subverting whole houses, okay? And, and who hates Jesus the most? I would say the Jews hate Jesus the most. Their Talmud teaches that Jesus is boiling in hot excrement. Like, talk about blasphemous. Okay, so their mouths must be stopped. Look, Titus 1, verse 12. Get posted down here. Titus 1, 12. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Okay, so this guy here is a Cretan, as it says it's one of their, one of their own. He says, Cretans are always liars, full bellies. Okay, let's say I lived in Winkler and I said, all Winklerites are liars. Well, how could what I said be true? It's a contradicting statement. But in verse 13 it says, this witness is true. It's not true what that guy said, it's true that he said it, okay? Some people, because that can really confuse you, if you think that this is saying that what he said was true, well, how can be true if he says all Christians are liars, but he's a Christian, so it makes him a liar, so then he lies. It's, it's uh, kind of a circular reasoning. So this witness is true, wherefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. Not giving heed to Jewish fables, for example, the Talmud, and commandments of man to turn from the truth. Okay, not giving heed to Jewish fables. And why do they allow these churches? They invite these Jewish rabbis into their churches and let them talk to their congregation. We're not even supposed to give heed to their fables. Never mind inviting them into our, our churches, because there's no such thing as Judeo-Christian. Okay? Because if, if the Jews believed the Old Testament, they would also believe Christ. Verse 15. Unto the pure are all things, unto the pure all things are pure, and to them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. So one of the things you think of when you read this verse is meats and drinks. We no longer have this restriction on our diet like it was in the Old Testament. We can eat bacon. We can eat shrimp. In fact, we can eat bacon and shrimp on a shish kebab if we want to. That would be tasty. Okay? And unto the pure are all things pure. There's no restrictions on diet in today's, uh, in the New Testament. Verse 16, last verse here. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny Him, being abominable. Remember, abominable means detestable or something that God hates and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. Okay? These, these false teachers are reprobates. Okay? It doesn't mean all reprobates are sodomites. Okay? All sodomites are reprobates. It just means that they come to the point where their God is hard in their heart and they're not going to believe. They profess that they know God. Like these people that I talked about, Joel Wolstein, all these guys, they profess they know God, but in works they deny Him, and God actually hates them, says they're, they're abominable. So that's, that's uh, kind of an overview of, of Titus, the guy Titus, and the different places in the Bible he's mentioned. And then in chapter 1, he, he was sent to ordain 
elders in every city, and Paul gives the qualifications for a bishop, and then he and then he starts talking about all these these vain talkers and and these deceivers that whose mouths must be stopped, and the bishop must be able to be fluent enough in the Bible and know where to go to refute these false doctrines. Let's say there was there's somebody that comes into our congregation and he's deceived by one of these false teachers and says, oh, the, the Nephilim, they're, they're 200 feet tall giants. And then you show him, should be able to show them from the Bible. Okay, you don't want a novice as a pastor. Okay, that's great. Thank you.